Hello, this is Eugene Blanchard of TelecomWorld101.com. Uh, we're going to take a look at the TCPIP and the OSI model. Um, just before we start, we'll do the standard disclaimer. This is a copyrighted video. Uh, you're welcome to link to this YouTube site and use it however you like, but you're not allowed to copy it or copy it onto your website or say that it's your property, etc. Blah, blah, blah. All right, so let's take a look at the TCPIP and the OSI model. Uh, we're going to take a look at a little bit of history lesson here. Back in the 1990s, there was a lot of different network standards, computers, and operating systems. Uh, There's LAN Manager. IBM and Microsoft developed it. Then they got upset with each other and had two separate versions of it. We had uh, Transcendental Operating System, TOPS. Uh, we had Banyan Vines. Uh, Microsoft had Windows for Work Groups. Um, the king of the networks was Novell Networks. Uh, and uh, if you were a certified Novell engineer, you could get a job anywhere. Uh, there was Unix, so we had operating systems like Linux, and Microsoft Windows, of course. Uh, we had different um, lower le uh, standards like Token Ring and uh, Ethernet. M Macintosh had Apple Talk and Local Talk. Uh, There's an operating system called IBM OS2, uh, another uh, network called ArcNet. And that's, so there's a lot of different networks going on. There's even four different types of Ethernet. Apple used a version called Ethernet Snap, right? Uh, Novell had a version called Ethernet 802.3. Now what happened is the IEEE were still developing their standards, 802.3 and 802.2, and uh, when 802.2 came out, what we found out is that Novell's version wasn't compatible with IEEE 802.3, and Novell even had a version called 802.2, which was compatible with 802.3 from IEEE gets confusing. Uh, Unix used a version called Ethernet 2. Now the problem was is that there was no standard way to communicate between these networks, operating systems, and computers. I remember on my PC I'd have to boot I'd have to boot to uh, uh, NetBIOS op, uh, protocol stack if I want to talk to Microsoft networks. I'd have to reboot if I wanted to talk to Unix. And I'd have to reboot it again if I wanted to talk to uh, Novell. So it was very uh, difficult. People wanted to share data. So we'd have a company administration would be running Microsoft Office products uh, and using NetBIOS. Um, in the uh, graphics department, the king was Macintosh. They'd be running Apple Talk or Local Talk. In engineering, they'd be running Unix. and you know, they want to share, but we couldn't. So that's where the OSI model came in. Um, the International Standards Organization realized there was a problem and created a template or a guide or a model called Open Systems Interconnect. And it was created to solve this interoperability problem. Uh, now, something important, it doesn't really exist. It's just a model. It's a guide. The OSI model is just a model or a guide. It's used to describe how networks work. So what's real then? Well, around the year 2000, the network wars ended and TCPIP won. So there were the winners. Uh, TCPIP is a suite of protocols. It's a whole bunch of protocols. It's more than just TCP and IP. And it's used by Unix and the Internet. TCPIP is real. So in summary, the OSI model was developed to figure out how to get all these computers, networks, and operating systems to talk to each other. The OSI model describes the network protocol stack, which is a set of rules that are used to describe how data is communicated over a network. Uh, now what's really interesting is that it also describes network devices. The OSI model consists of seven layers. We always present it in this manner, seven at the top and layer one at the bottom. So starting at the top, we have layer seven is the application layer, layer six is the presentation, layer five is the session, layer four is the transport, layer three is the network, layer two is the data link, and layer one is the physical. Now, when you're in networking, you have to know this. So a good way of remembering this just when you're starting is to use this phrase, please do not take salami pizza away. So if you start from the bottom, please re uh, refers to the physical layer, do re refers to the data link, not to network, take to transport, salami to session, pizza to presentation, and away to the application. So please do not take salami pizza away. And that's a good way to remember it. Now each layer has a very special function and we're going to start by taking a look at the layer 7, the application layer. Uh, this is a top-down approach for explaining it and I find personally that it's, uh, uh, it's a, a good way to understand when you first look at this. So layer 7 consists of the network aware of applications. So these are programs that are aware of the network and 
they need to work with the network uh, they need a network to work properly so examples are email email needs a network otherwise it's pretty useless uh, web browsers you have a web browser talks to a web server file sharing services uh, like NetBIOS or Samba or um, FTP if you want to share files uh, print servers uh, you want to share a printer it needs to know the network uh, network drives at work I have a, an old drive which is a, a, a shared drive among uh, all the employees and then we have a H drive which is my private drive that I can uh, save information specific for uh, what I do uh, we also have uh, social programs social media programs like Twitter and Facebook uh, MySpace was an old one uh, LinkedIn is another one and you also have a lot of the games now are online multiplayer games like uh, World of Tanks which I play a lot I play way too much as my wife says uh, so they all need a network to work properly so their application layer layer 6 is the presentation layer its job is to configure the data right so sometimes it doesn't do anything it doesn't have to but other times uh, you do so example is that you connect up to a website using HTTP it's all clear text don't have to do anything but let's say you went to log into a secure site all of a sudden what you'll end up doing is you have encryption you're going to encryption your uh, your data for security uh, virtual private network uses encryption portion of this uh, maybe what happens is you have low bandwidth on your uh, net wide area network link and you're going to use compression right so you're going to compress the data uh, sometimes you might have to translate the data as an example is in the PC world uh, we represent alphanumeric characters using uh, an ASCII code so what happens is computers understand binary so what we have is a translation table that basically encodes our alphanumeric characters into uh, uh, a binary format the one we use is ASCII American Standard Code for Information Interchange now sometimes you might be having t to talk to a uh, another operating system like the IBM mainframes used a, a, an encoding method called EPSIDEC which was extended binary coded decimal interface code or something like this and uh, so you do translation at, at the layer 6 I would translate between ASCII and EPSIDEC layer 5 is a session layer and and the, and the term session is sort of like if you go to your therapist and uh, and you have a session you're talking about you know how much you love your mother or hate your mother or whatever the story is that's a session so what we have is between two computers they'll have a session also and layer 5 deals with that session and some of the things they'll deal with is login rights so we talked about a secure web server so if you uh, uh, do you have login rights on that server do you have a username and password you use so that's the login rights permissions once you're logged in do you have uh, permissions to read write or execute uh, programs and applications on there can you change uh, directories can you create directories can you make directories and delete files those are the permissions you might have uh, the rights are are you an administrator are you um, uh, a user are you a guest so you have different rights so we have on the session layer its job is to look at these different um, services or, or rights that you have and login permissions and rights layer 4 is a transport layer it's got the job to guarantee end-to-end -end delivery of data so what happens is a um, in a client server type model is that you'll send some data to the destination uh, one of the things you want to know is the destination there does it exist um, do you want you want to know that when you send data that it receives it so the destination will send you acknowledgments um, when the destination gets data it wants to make sure that it's um, it's not corrupt so it's going to do error checking on it and verify the uh, the data um, so what we'll find is the transport layer is jobs to guarantee that end-to-end -end delivery of data uh, layer 3 is the network it has the duty to find the shortest path to the destination network so layer 3 finds th the destination network uh, the shortest path is a term um, that doesn't mean the shortest physical distance it means typically the um, shortest time to get to the destination and there's different metrics that different network protocols uh, routing protocols can use some might say uh, they might take into account congestion is there congestion on the network um, the bandwidth to get to the destination uh, is it a reliable network how many routers does it have to pass through that's called a hop count so the uh, network later has a duty to find the shortest path to the destination network 
Layer 2, the data link layer, has two um, functions. It decides whose turn it is to talk. Uh, the fancy name for that is called bus arbitration. So if you have a network where you have multiple computers are sharing that network, how do you decide whose turn it is to talk? Well, the data link layer will have different uh, um, bus arbitration methods uh, available for it to, to make that decision. The other thing it does is it finds the physical device on the network. So what we have is layer three, the network layer. Its job is to find the network. Layer two, the data link, its job is to find the physical device on the network. Right? Layer one, the physical layer, it describes the physical part of the network. This is the stuff that you can touch and feel. The rest of the stuff is in software and firmware. We really can't see it, but this we can actually see. So some of the things we can see are cables. Uh, right? So this describes the physical part of the network, and in this instance, cables. And we're going to indicate the cable type. Is it coax cable, or is it twisted pair? It'll describe what the physical properties of the cable are. What is the capacitance per foot? It'll say the length of the cable, uh, things like that like that, uh, how many strands are in the cable, how many pairs and wires and shielding and stuff. It'll describe the voltages that we're going to run on the cable, the frequencies that that cable can handle and what we're going to put through it, the connectors, um, you know, is it going to be RJ45 for Ethernet, which uses a, the actual name of the connector is 8P8C, but it's wired up for uh, Ethernet, we call it RJ45. If it's uh, uh, how we're going to encode the bits on the, on, on the wire, or it could be wireless also, it could be microwave, it could be fiber optics, this is all part of the physical layer. Uh, when we encode the bits, uh, it's basically saying how are we going to represent a bit on a piece of wire? Well, a bit could be, uh, there's different encoding methods, some are um, a unipolar, bipolar, return to zero, non-return to zero, Manchester, one of my favorites. I remember reading about it in the 80s. I went, wow, this is a, just a work of art. Really like Manchester encoding. Uh, it'll describe the transfer rates that we're going to use. So it'd be like, is it 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, gigabit per second, or maybe it's only 64 k bits per second. And there's a whole bunch more that the uh, layer one of the OSI model physical layer discusses. So now we had the OSI model, which isn't real. It's just a guide that describes how a network protocol stack works. And we have something real, TCP IP. TCP IP has four layers. And the first layer that we're going to look at is the application layer. And it maps to the OSI model layers, application layer, presentation layer, and session layer. So what we'll find is the application layer does all three of those functions. Uh, it has a layer called the transport layer, which matches to the transport layer in the OSI model. Uh, we have the internet layer which maps to the network layer in the OSI model. And we have the network access layer, which maps to the data link and the physical layer. Now, in this presentation, what we'll find out is that sometimes it's easier to talk about the OSI model. It'll be more clear. And sometimes it'll be easier to talk about the application layer. And I'll try to make it clear between the two and to show the, uh, um, the mapping between. Well, this is the end of part one. Uh, next is the uh, part two, which is the OSI model and the protocols. So uh, stay tuned for that one. 